Well, hello there, this is Shane from Shane's Reviews and I hope you are having a great day today. What are we gonna be talking about? It's gonna be Speaker from the Dead wrote by Orson Scott Card and it was narrated by um, Stefan Rudnicki and David, I'm gonna have to cheat, David Burney. <laughs> I chose the wrong day for that color, didn't I? So, I'm kind of glad that things have worked out the way they have. I'm always thankful for whenever I get a chance to just stop for a second, which hasn't really happened over the last two months, but that's okay because it serves a purpose. But the reason why I say that is I'm in a much different place now than I was whenever I first read The Speaker for the Dead. And I think whenever I first read that, it was quite a while ago. End of the 90s, early 2000s-ish, right around in there. Now, the thing about the difference between me then and me now and this book, whenever I read it then versus now, that's that's the more important thing. I've said this a couple times where I really think that sometimes literature, whenever we force people to read it before they're ready for it, isn't necessarily a good thing. So like in schools, whenever you have regular English and they're wanting to expose those of us that really aren't into blah, 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 blah at that point in life to those concepts and ideas. I mean, even though if you read them and you have a modicum of understanding of what it's actually about, you don't have the life experience to be able to relate to that story. And whenever I first read Ender's Game and Speaker of the Dead, Xenocide, all these books, I... I didn't have that capability yet. I didn't have the life experience yet, but I enjoyed them for different reasons then than I did now. The whole reason why at that point in time in my life that these books was interesting to me was the dynamic of the brother and sister in between Valentine and Ender and of course their brother Peter. Even though I technically speaking had siblings, the only times that I had ever met them was in passing. So every once in a while one of them would come up and they'd be there for a little while. I'd get to spend some time with them and then they'd be gone. And so I think it was that I had fallen kind of for the idea of it, even though I had never really had that. With all that to the side, at the point that I had listened to Speaker for the Dead in the past, there wasn't a, or at least the version that I listened to, didn't have the end note from the author, from Orson Scott Card. And in this specific one that I just finished listening to, it does have one of those. And what he essentially said at the end note was that he had wrote and had this concept of this idea for Speaker of the Dead, but there needed to be an introduction. And so Ender's Game was actually supposed to be the introduction to the Speaker of the Dead. And it makes sense. I mean, if you don't look at it from a logical perspective of book one, book two, but if you look at it from the story, from the narrative, because if we had just gone into the Book of the Dead, or sorry, not the Book of the Dead, Speaker for the Dead, I wonder how many times I said that. <laughs> but if we look at that, and if that was the first book in the series that I picked up, sure, it would have been interesting, but there would have been so much stuff that would have been unknown. There would have been so much stuff that made no sense because there wasn't any backstory. And the question of why do I care about Ender, which is the main character for the most part of moving the story along, why do I care about this individual? Now, we would have started to care about the other people like Novina, Novinia, uh, Pibo, Libo, Nero. <laughs> fairly large assembly of people that are in that and the way that this character Ender would be influencing them and how does he why does he even have all this stuff why does he have this this innate power this innate ability to do this or this or why is it such a big deal that he ended a war between aliens and humans you know all this stuff in a conjective linear way just would not have worked whatsoever so I'm glad that he had took the time to express some of that verbal diarrhea as authors sometimes do but this was such a good way of doing it because now whenever we read the book after we have the first one all these little things make a lot more sense some of them are free ideas of you know how would this work how would this work you can accept it you don't have to know all of it to make it work and it's the freedom of where the ideas can go because Orson Scott Card typically whenever I read him I'm not really expecting an author that is going to be so entirely locked into what he's trying to say that he doesn't have any freedom of character so they're not so rigid they're actually able to express their ideas and learn from each other and to grow as characters, which is kind of a big thing for me at the moment. Uh, whenever it comes to literature, I really like seeing characters do that. And yes, I know that some people in the past, whenever I've brought this book up, said, that's a kid's book. It's really not. It's no more a kid's book than the original Looney Tunes was a kid's cartoon. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 
there really wasn't. Anyway, in the long of it all, let's just go ahead and talk about the narrations. Stefan Rudnicki is, to me, like the voice of Honey. I love listening to this guy. And same thing with Scott Brick. I mean, he's... I, if I could put the two of those guys in a room and just have them read dissertations or even the most boring stuff, I could listen for quite some time. I enjoy hearing both of them and for different reasons. You know, Scott Brick's more of a, a smooth, smooth player where Stefan, he's he's got this rawness to the way that he portrays things. He's He's got more of the emotional casting. Not saying that Scott Brick doesn't do that, but I really like the way that Stefan does it. So if I could put the two of them in the room, have Scott as the narrator, have Stefan as reading the main characters, maybe a little bit of interplay back and forth at different points. Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be a good day. And that's going to be the question of the week. If you had your choice of having any book that you've ever read or listened to read by your favorite narrator, what would the book be and who would be the person doing the narration. If there's a couple of authors that you want, or maybe a series, or or something that wasn't necessarily a book that would be in the lane that we would talk about, I don't care what it is. I would just like to see what you guys and gals think. Now, whenever it comes down to what's actually happening inside the book, oof, ooh, boy, there's some stuff in this one. We get a different kind of a pacing, really, than we did in Ender's Game. In Ender's Game, uh, there was a couple phases to me in that book, and I don't know how you feel about it if you've read it, but there's the whole thing with the way that it starts, it's a little bit slow, and you've got the kids in the regular school environment, we get an introduction to Ender, to parts of Ender's family, we get very clear definitions of the characters or the persons that are around him at that point in time, and then it kind of steps up a little bit, and then it goes full manic with a small break in the middle, and then it goes back to a manic pacing. I can see kind of a different rhythm in this one being that there's a lot on the front end that needs more development because we're at a new place. We have planet that has a completely different ecological system than what we have on Earth. Life there works completely differently than it does here. So that pacing isn't the same type of a rhythm. Story time. Once upon a time, there was a author that I really enjoyed to read and it had never hit me that sometimes people will follow a kind of a template for writing because it makes it easier for them and once they have something that is established that works for them they'll stick with that template. This person, this author, I mean if I met him I would still maybe fanboy out a whole lot, don't get me wrong, but I had noticed in the books after this was brought to me that I was reading the exact same story every single time. Just some of the names were different and the events were different, but it was always the same story with the same pacing and the same this and the same this. There really wasn't any kind of new concepts to it. You might as well have just had some dice with some different events and different ways of things happening and different names on it and just throwing the dice at particular points to see what happened. I mean, don't get me wrong, the guy is very, very well known and did very well for himself and kudos to him for that. But as soon as that was pointed out to me, it killed me on reading this guy's stuff. I just, oh, it did it for me. I was just like, well, okay. And I thought it wasn't going to bother me and I got the next three books that he had wrote and it bothered me. And so I just, I quit reading him altogether. Now, Orson Scott Card, he, he's not as much as that guy was. Whenever it comes to the planet and it comes to the problems that they're in, it's amazing. So if you don't know, the Speaker of the Dead is something that was kind of brought up at the three quarters to the end of the first book. Essentially, it was a book that Valentine had wrote slash Ender had wrote together where it was explaining the life and death of the entire civilization of the buggers. Essentially, the Speaker of the Dead, what the function of that is is that individual will tell the story much like Ender did in the book that he put out that was about the buggers. And so it's a person that will come in and tell the story, the life story, the truth of the person that has passed away. And a little bit of backstory, Ender, he has the last egg of the queen the hive queen of the buggers. So he's been searching all these planets over the course of time, 3,000-ish years, and that's because of faster light travel, of course, but he's been looking for a place to put her so that she could grow, and it's just not happened because it's either too much this or too much this, the conditions have never been right, and he's had this internal dilemma on the inside that is very plain and evident that, yes, I love this, this creature, yes, I love this thing, and I want to allow 
the entire civilization that they had to come back because they were great. However, if it's the best thing for them, is it the best thing for us? So that's the first. Second thing is, as mentioned, the planets. The, the third governing body there in his problem is nobody knows that the egg is under his bed in his ship. And they still have communications from her to him. And she's really pushing to land to be able to hatch to start again and she wants to you know rightfully so bring her entire civilization back around and Ender's just having a hard time with it that is very important because he's been looking at this one planet actually a few planets but he gets a call from one of the planets to be a speaker of the dead for an individual where the conditions are mostly good for her and her children that will come. So, whenever he gets this, he goes. And of course, whenever he's most of the way there, the call is canceled, but another one comes in. Yay, author's freedoms. <laughs> but he's not wanted there because they're a very, very stout, very religious funding a group. And they're not allowed to go out on the entire planet. This planet is actually a place where they're studying these animals called piggies, but they're not actually animals. They are individuals with their own minds and they have intelligence. And in the second book, Speaker for the Dead, that's where we have the conflict of two of the researchers are killed by these creatures. And these creatures are able to communicate with us. We're able to communicate with them. Over the course of time, they have learned our languages and we're still struggling to learn theirs. And there's a lot of mystery that comes around them. It seems like the women kind of these creatures aren't there, but they are there. There's pretty much only males that the researchers ever see. And there's a lot of almost mysticism in the way that these creatures are talking to their ancestors, which they call true trees and our trees. I mean, it's, it's the, there's a lot of these little intricacy type of details that are starting to come through. But even though that part of the story was so very much fascinating because I'm a questioning type. I love curiosity. I love trying to find out this and this and this. It's not that I completely absorb myself into something whenever I'm interested in it, but if something catches my attention, I really go out of my way to see exactly what makes that thing do what it does. Just because. So, Ender gets there to speak for the dead, and the wife of the person, Novinia, as I had mentioned before, doesn't really want him there because there's secrets, and all of these secrets, of course, come out into the open. Now, we have major problems that start to show up, so there's a possibility that they have to revolt against human society in order to ensure that these creatures that are so completely misunderstood are indeed saved. And then there's another thing that they're dealing with their own kind of a plague, and if they go other places, they're going to spread that, and it's going to kill everything on every planet they go to. And then there's the Hive Queen. And is this going to be the place where she's going to actually grow and start things over? Hmm. There's a lot of things that are going on back and forth between Valentine and Andrew. There's a lot of things going on between Novinia's kids and Andrew. There's so much, so much, so much that happens in this. And it's it's a wonderful story. Not only for the brother and sister that have been separated. Not only for him being Ender and coming to a new place. And so very completely, quickly, and with great agility, working his way into their society. Even though the main priest was saying that he was indeed Satan and you should not listen to a word this person has to say. Yeah, that, that's there. It's funny. Also, there's these other things that I just, I'm, I'm not going to tell you about. I want you to read it if you haven't. Because if you like space and you like sci-fi and mystery type things, this will really, really ring your bell for you. So is it worth your time, efforts, and energies? Yes, it most certainly is. Whenever it comes to my top tier list, right? There's a few of them that are up there. I mean, quite frankly, this one's usually always on the top shelf. I don't always go back and reread it every year because, I mean, quite frankly, I've, I've read them so much that it's not that I'm infallible, but I know a lot of the story <laughs> and I know a lot of the details and the interactions. And because of that and it being special to me for my own reasons, I don't want to overread this because I've done that with another series in the past and I've yet to go back to it, but I do miss it. It was a good story, so I might be getting closer. Anyhow, thoughts and feelings that this book brought out of me. It, it did the same thing it did last time. I really didn't have any, and this is good because I got so pulled into the story that 
I didn't want to come out of it. It's been a while since I've come across another author that can do this, for me anyway, and I'm sure that you wonderful people, you've experienced this as well or you wouldn't be here watching the video. And I just, I really like that because it was highly entertaining. It had some suspense about it. It had some mystery about it. it and it was, of course, you know, space and sci-fi and all this kind of thing all wrapped up in the one. So really well done. If Orson Scott Card ever sees this, dude, thank you so much. And I'm so glad you listened to your wife about not making this another music book. Good choice on both of your parts. Anyway, with that being said, here are the most interesting things that we have found this week in our comment section. Thank you so much for that. Actually, as soon as I get done reading this, I'm gonna go back and make sure that I haven't missed anybody and that I'll make sure that everybody's been replied to. So thank you again so much for that. Uh, and also, if there's any books like this out in the world that I have missed, that's like Ender's Game and Speaker of the Dead and Xenocide, let me know about it. I would love to read them. Thank you so much for your time. You know what to do. Like, share, subscribe. This is Shane from Shane's Reviews. And we'd like to thank you for watching to the end. You are our heroes. Thank you so much. Cheers. Applause. Woo! Confetti. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> anyway, stay safe, stay healthy. I know it's a weird world right now, but we got to do the best we can, right? So I'm not sure which one of these videos over here you'll pick, but if you pick one of those, I will see you in the next video. Peace.